So we have this show here. It's a podcast. Doing it for the Windsor Public Library. I'm Dave. I'm Adam. And it's called Fiction. Or Nonfiction. Yes. And what we do is we talk about stuff. And one of our things we go to a lot is food. I don't know why. Maybe it's because we usually record these around lunchtime. I think so. Speaking of which, let's grab a snack. Cue music. Non-fiction. We're going to talk about sandwiches, okay? I love sandwiches. We're going to discuss where did they come from, why do they exist. My first question to you is, when was the very first sandwich invented? Was it in 1800, 1765, or 1762? You're giving me multiple choice now. This is great. Yeah. I like 62 because it's divisible by two. Like there's two pieces of bread surrounding a sandwich so i'm gonna go with that one you are correct if we had a bell i would ring it because you would win the prize of nothing really but yes it was first invented in 1762 and here's my question to you wait was it by the earl of sandwich well you ruined my question (laughs) my question (laughs) but yes it was by the earl of sandwich here's my question then uh what was the earl of sandwich's real name was it elvis presley George Anderson, Joan Crawford, or John Montague? Well, I feel like this is a really loaded multiple choice question because I can tell you three of those are not the person. Uh, I'm going to go with Montague. Correct. And, you know, I didn't have my list of names properly, uh, so I made them up. (laughs) That's what we're here for. We are here on fiction or nonfiction to kind of talk about stuff, but also tell you where we get this information from. I got this information from a few different resources, okay? Um, For the sandwich, history of sandwiches, um, I I referenced uh, this pbs.org article, which has a lot of research in it. The article's called Discover the History of the Sandwich. came out in 2013. I will take you up on that offer. And uh, I got this information from there. I also got from a few different sources, Wikipedia, but I referenced there, as we discussed on a previous episode. At the bottom, they have... Uh, link with a little number where they got the resources from. Yeah, so, um, you know, th- maybe we should just get into a little bit of detail about that because we're not sure if any of you may have listened to the previous episode. This may be your first time listening to the podcast on Wikipedia. If you're doing research, it's not the best resource to use. No. However, when people make claims or put in quote unquote facts on Wikipedia, they are obligated to put in a link to some sort of reference where they got the information, whether it's citing an article in a book or even having a hyperlink going to a website or a particular video. And so you always want to double check that and always check the links they give as well, because even though they state they may be uh, relevant, you still want to actually check that link to make sure the information in there is valid. Yes. And, you know, there's also we're going to reference a little later when we talk about something else. Uh, History.com has an article about this and they also have an article about the history of sandwiches and bread and they're there's they're reputable sources they do their research but, you know, this is interesting because we did an episode not too long ago on hot dogs and we talked about the idea how there was this uh, bavarian uh sausage seller that, that was a weird sentence to say but he was giving out gloves to people to handle these hot these hot dogs if you will and the gloves kept on getting stolen so his wife recommended just put the sausage inside a bun. And that's how the idea of the bun carrying the sausage came to be. Was there a similar thing with the sandwich that you're aware of? Um, well, not as cool of a story. But this isn't something that, like, it is referenced a lot. Like, you know, it's common knowledge that the Earl of Sandwich invented the sandwich. A lot of people might know that even if they didn't look it up. But here's some information for you. John Montague otherwise known as the fourth Earl of Sandwich um, in the UK. The first sandwich was made in 1972, and this is apparently how the story goes. From a Wait, few what year? 1972? Yes. Uh, no. The first sandwich was made in 1762. 1762. All right. Okay. Yes. And from a variety of stories, you know, I'm just paraphrasing from a few different sources, but this is generally how the story goes. Montague was playing a game of cards, and he didn't want to get up from his table to leave. He wanted to keep playing, and it was dinner time. He was hungry. So he asked for a serving of roast beef to be placed between two slices of bread 
so that he could eat it with his hands and not get up from the table and continue playing his game of cards. Ingenious. Wow. And, and uh, it's been referenced in a lot of things. There's a book from uh, 1700s from a French writer named Pierre-Jean Grosley, which was called Londres, which I believe means a tour of London. And there's some lines about that. But yeah, this is just one of the many things I sourced from about this story. So uh, essentially, the conception and execution of this long-standing favored food throughout developed Western culture has mainly been because this rich guy was too lazy to get up from the table. Yeah, basically. Um, what an inspiration. But, you know, <laughs> it's it's difficult. It, it's difficult to pinpoint exactly when some of these things happened because it is possible that maybe some maybe another point in history before this someone thought of putting something between two pieces of bread but i also wanted to continue on the subject of sandwiches would you oh, like to continue on the subject of i sandwiches? would love a sandwich continuum that this sounds great now we do want to mention if you're in the mood for trying out some tasty sandwiches <laughs> and you want some inspiration we actually have some great books about sandwich making and sandwiches that you can actually make at home at the Windsor Public Library. So we do encourage you to check out our collection, and you can even visit our website at windsorpubliclibrary.com and get some information about different sandwiches you can make, some uh, great cookbooks, and just in general, wonderful information. And uh, we do have to admit, our primary source for information tends to be the library itself, since, you know, conveniently we work here. Yes, we do. Here's, a, here's some more sandwich factoids for anyone out there that's interested. I want to take a bite. Go ahead. The earliest recognizable form of a sandwich might be known as the Hillel sandwich or the Korch, which I'm probably mispronouncing, K-O-R-E-C-H, and it was eaten during Jewish Passover. Ah. Hillel, the elder who is a Jewish leader and rabbi that lived in Jerusalem, a long time ago, it says 110 BC, a suggested eating bitter herbs inside unleaved matzo bread. So here's another thing where, you know, it could have happened before. Uh, there's a lot of facts out there. Sandwiches first started appearing in cookbooks in 1816 in America. Mm -hmm. The fillings were no longer limited to just cold meat, as a lot of the early recipes were. They included things such as cheese, fruit, shellfish, nuts, and mushrooms. Following the Civil War, an increase in sandwich consumption happened because they could be found anywhere, from high-class luncheons to taverns to whatever. They became a common thing. By the end of the 19th century, sandwiches earned new names in many different forms because there were so many different types popping up, mm -hmm. such as the club sandwich and the corned beef Reuben sandwich. The Reuben, a very popular sandwich. It's been a, a long-standing favorite in North America. I know that. And I just was trying to find this, so I just found this randomly online. This is just a poll. According to Eat This, Not That, eatthis.com, what are the three most popular sandwiches? I'm going to give what I think might be the three most popular sandwiches. Okay. And they're not going to be pretty ones because I'm trying to think common denominator across the board sandwiches. I'm going to go with, um, first off, grilled cheese. Okay. Perennial favorite, especially for me. I'm going to go with the Reuben because it is a classic. And then I think one that is almost ubiquitous for just about any restaurant or chain you're going to go to, the BLT. See, I agree with that. But according to Eat This, Eat Not That, it's different. Okay, so what do they say? Well, number one is actually the grilled cheese. That's number one. Yes. I find that very surprising. Wow. Number two, according to them, is grilled chicken, and number three is turkey. Uh, BLT th is not anywhere on there. That's surprising to me. Huh. Also, ham is so low on that list. I think they're number five. That's shocking to me, really. But that's just a poll. Sandwiches are everywhere. With all this said, sandwiches are a very popular food. I think it's really interesting that you detailed this history of it, that it went from something that was kind of part of the uh, aristocrats, like diet. You have this pretty entitled guy who's too lazy to get up from playing his card game, ask a servant to put some meats between bread for him, and then it's become really a sandwich of the working class, like the everyman sort of food. You take a sandwich with you to work, and that's Sa your meal. Sandwiches are for everybody. Whatever you want on them, that's your decision, but... Sandwiches are for everybody. So I have a question for you. And listeners, I will admit this is not so much a fiction or nonfiction, but I just want to get some interesting facts out of Dave because I think in my life I've encountered some bizarre sandwich fillings. What is the most bizarre sandwich filling you've ever encountered? I've never had it, but mm. I've heard of uh, peanut butter and pickles. Peanut butter and pickles. Is that a combination? 
I've never had this myself, but I have many friends and coworkers who swear by this. There is a local business, a great restaurant in our community of Windsor, Ontario called Toasties that actually specializes in grilled cheese sandwiches and various other sandwiches. And they have one that is basically a Thanksgiving dinner between two slices of bread that incorporates uh, potatoes, turkey, and cranberries. So the cranberry is probably the weirdest one for me I've encountered. Now, I'm going to give you a question, Dave. Okay. And this is also going to be somewhat food-related. doesn't have to be. Oh, it's going to be. Okay. So, you talked about sandwiches. And, you know, what's, what's related to a sandwich? Another very popular food. A wrap? Well, well it's also something that's between two wedges of wheated substance. A panini? It's a bun. Oh, a bun? A, a Kaiser roll? No, what, what, what's a thing that... Ch- ciabatta? Right? You're naming everything except the most obvious thing. A dinner roll. A hamburger. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've <laughs> so, heard of those. Yeah, you've heard of those. A hamburger is... It's, it's kind of like a, a sandwich, right? No ham involved, though. No ham. So, here's my story, and you have to tell me if it's fiction or nonfiction. The hamburger is so named because it was created in Hamburg, Germany. I'm going to say that's false. I want Dave to retrieve his information data device, a.k.a. his phone, and I want him to look up how the hamburger got its name. According to the USDA government website, this is a question. Where did the name hamburger come from? The name hamburger comes from the seaport town of Hamburg, Germany, where it is thought that 19th century sailors brought back the idea of raw shredded beef, known today as beef tartare, after trading with the Baltic provinces of Russia. So interesting. So a lot of supposition that it's named after that. However, nothing confirmed. Yeah, it's just one of those things like it's been around forever. Like we talked about hot dogs, uh, sandwiches, now hamburgers. You know, what's next? I don't know. I have something else to discuss with you, Adam. Okay, this is important. Let's go. Is this fiction or nonfiction? Okay, I'm going to ask you about the saying, which is very popular. It's a common saying. The greatest thing since sliced bread is a saying that people use sometimes. The saying is the greatest thing since sliced bread? No, 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 no. Just the term, the phrase. Oh, yes, yes. Okay. The phrase, the greatest thing since sliced bread. Okay. When was this first used? Was this first used in 1930, 1928, or 1915? Well, it would have to be after sliced bread was originated, I guess. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, just for context for anyone listening, there was a time where you would buy bread. It would not come to you pre-sliced. You had to do all you the cutting s- yourself. You had to be a self-slicer. You know, if anyone's ever cut their own bread. I cut the bread all the time. It it gets all squishy sometimes, you not know. My, not me. Unless you have a good knife. I have a good knife, and I, I do love cutting my own bread. But to the, your point... I'm just going to go with the earliest date because I believe sliced bread was not actually widely available until the turn of the 20th century. So I'm going to go with 1915. Okay. You are incorrect, Adam. I, I'm a, the best time to find that out. Okay. okay. What is the so truth? Tell it, me, Dave. Tell me. It originates around the time of when sliced bread was first commercially available, which would have been in July of 1928. Huh. That late. So the phrase, the greatest thing from since sliced bread, um, is basically used to praise this invention. People use it nowadays when they're trying to say something like, it's something great, like a great invention that's improving our lives. But mm-hmm. back then it was part of an ad campaign and it was modified and now people use this phrase. The greatest thing since sliced bread, the greatest invention since sliced bread. Huh, interesting. Sliced commercial loaves of bread were produced in July of 1928 in Chillicothe, Missouri. Missouri. Ooh, was it by Wonder Bread? Wonder Bread came around in 1930. Oh. They were one of the very first companies that was popular with their selling of sliced bread. Um, but the sliced bread machine was invented by Otto Rowetter of Iowa, Missouri, and he was a jeweler. He invented it. Oh, interesting. Um, and then by 1930, most towns in the U.S., were able to get sliced bread in stores. And yes, it was partially due to Wonder. Wonder Bread was uh, one of the first companies that had sliced bread widely available. But 
bread was actually sliced bread was actually banned briefly in the U.S. They banned the manufacturing of it and selling of it because during World War II they needed to conserve resources. So factory sliced bread, including Wonder Bread, was briefly banned by the U.S. government in an effort to conserve resources such as the paper used to wrap each loaf of bread. What to maintain the freshness. So this came, this information came from a really great article on history.com called Who Invented Sliced Bread from 2018. There you go. The greatest thing since sliced bread. Wow, that's amazing. We've learned about sandwiches, about hamburgers, and about sliced bread. This is everything I needed to know. Dave, what a mouthful of information, like a nice Reuben sandwich. Dave, we're going to get you to take a back seat for this one because we actually have a returning special guest in the form of Becky. Hello. Becky, thank you for agreeing to this. And uh, I know you probably came because the theme of this episode is sandwiches. That's part of the reason why you came, yes. However, I got some bad news for you. Uh Uh-oh. I'm actually going to be giving you a story that has nothing at all to do with sandwiches. Well, maybe the thing involved enjoy sandwiches. However, this is going to be a urban legend, and I need you to tell me if it is fiction or nonfiction. Okay, I'm ready. Okay. So, you may have heard this one before. I call it A Boy and His Dog. Oh, no. So, a long time ago, at least a decade ago, I guess that's a long time, there was a family that was vacationing in Mexico. The boy who accompanied his parents actually was quite bored, so he walked around the property of the resort, and while he wasn't able to find any other children to play with, he found a stray puppy. He fell in love with the dog right away and took it home to the hotel room. Now, his parents at first were a little bit aghast over the sight of this dog. He looked a little mangy, he looked like he had a little bit of snot running down his snout, and they just overall thought it was a really ugly looking dog. However, their son was in love with it, and they just could not think about separating their son from this dog for their trip, so two weeks passed, the son and the dog are inseparable. And so the son is mortified come the end of the vacation where the parents tell him they have to leave the dog behind. Heartbreaking, right? Well, what ends up happening is the child is pleading and crying so much that eventually the parents, they just cave in and they say, okay, you know what? We're going to bring the pet back with us. But there's a problem. Of course, bringing a pet across borders between countries is very difficult. You have to find uh, the right paperwork, file it, process it. It's a very lengthy process. So the parents decided, you know what we're going to do? We're going to smuggle this dog in. Oh, no. Okay. They were able to successfully bring the dog back to America. So some time passes. It's actually the summertime, which is why they're all on vacation. Summer vacation ends, and the boy decides, I want to take my dog to school for show and tell. So he brings it with him on the school bus, goes on his way, His parents are fine with it until a little bit later in the day. They get a phone call from the school. It's from the principal. And he says, we need you to come to the school right away. Does this story sound familiar at all so far? I don't know. I don't don't think I've heard this story, no. Okay. This is where the story gets a little bit juicy. So the parents meet the principal. And of course, they're very concerned. What's going on? Is our son okay? The principal reassures them, no, no, your boy is fine. Actually, we need to talk to you about the pet that he brought in. He leads the parents into the science lab where the science teacher is standing next to their dog, which is inside a steel cage. Oh no. That's scary. He sees the parents and he goes, oh, I'm really glad I have a chance to meet you. I have some questions about your pet. It's quite unusual. Where did you get it? And of course, at this point, the parents don't want to admit to illegally smuggling in a dog from Mexico. So they just, you know, ramble a little bit. They say, oh, we adopted it. It was a a mutt that we found. And the science teacher goes, 
Interesting, interesting. And finally, the parents have had enough of all this suspense. They go, okay, what is going on? What was so important about this dog that you needed to call us in? Well, says the science teacher, I'm afraid to tell you that your dog is not a dog at all. It's actually a giant Mexican sewer rat. And that's the story. So, Becky, I see... I, I love the look on your face right now. I was speechless. Um, is this... Do you think this is fiction or non-fiction, or at the very least, based on true events? Do they make rats that big? I guess if they eat the right stuff, I don't know. Like, I can believe that a rat would maybe get to be the size of a very small dog. I believe that. What is difficult is that someone would mistaken a rat for a dog. How can you mistake a dog for a rat or a rat for a dog? Unless you have a rat dog. I really hope that this isn't true, but I don't know. I feel like humans, you know, you just don't know. You just don't know. Now, Dave, he's cowering in the corner. I know he doesn't like the story. That is not a fact. <laughs> I, I, I want to say this is a fictional story. Like, I believe that there are large rats in existence, but uh, yeah, I think this story might be fiction. Uh, before we get to the answer, I'm just wondering, as a librarian, you perform research for people all the time as part of your job. What would be your first step in performing research to unpack the truthfulness of the story? I would, I would start with probably a simple internet search. Mm -hmm. Like, especially if it's something that's happened over the last 10 years, then it's, it's recent enough where there would be news articles, maybe maybe some actual like video clips Mm -hmm. yeah like i feel like that's the basics of it is that it's recent enough where you should be able to see some sort of um photographic evidence Mm -hmm. now this story i will let you know dates back quite a while the first recorded instance of this where there's some sort of written record of the story goes back to 1983 okay so with that does that challenge your search for this information That could make it a little bit more difficult because I know that if it was true, that finding it in a reputable newspaper or um, other media source, that may be more difficult just because it's older. Mm -hmm. And that would predate our our, public internet. So that would make it challenging. Uh, Luckily, we're not the only ones interested in this story. There is actually an urban legend researcher and reporter whose name is Jan Harold Brunvand, and he actually has a great book out that details his own search for an answer for this, titled Too Good to Be True, which was a compilation of different articles he had written over the years, uh, which unpacks urban legends and myths, and this was one of them. This was actually originally an article simply titled The Mexican Pet that he first wrote back in 1986. Wow. So as far back as then, he was researching it. And the reason that Brunvand came across the story was actually because of his son. His son approached him and said that he heard a similar story. Of course, being that Brunvand did research urban legends, skepticism was the first thing in his mind. So he asked his son the first question we should all ask, which is... Where did you hear this from? Exactly. (laughs) Where did you hear this from? And his son goes, I heard it from the neighbor. So Brunvan goes to the neighbor and asks, Where did you hear this from? Exactly. And then the neighbor said, I heard it on the radio. So after some hemming and hawing, they were able to recall the radio station and the day that they heard the story. Brunvan did that research. He was able to approach someone at the radio station. And in addition to this, I will say he also contacted the local police authorities. And he also contacted uh, a local news station just to see if the police or the news station had any records of such a case occurring. The police and the local news station, they had nothing. And then as for the radio station, he did get in contact with an employee named Dave Franco. Not the same Dave Franco. (laughs) (laughs) Although that would be something. Uh, He simply stated it was a hoax. Okay. 
yeah, after checking all these sources, this particular iteration of the story was a myth. So in his essay, he basically is purporting that these are all likely myths. He did some firsthand research as well and couldn't find any records about people smuggling in Mexican rats, any sort of topical news items. So he basically did our work for us. Okay. But I guess the question then is begged, why why this story? Why did it become so popular? I mean, I guess with with like all urban legends, there's a I feel like they're kind of there to kind of instill fear in people, right? Mm-hmm. So so maybe this is a a story that parents tell their kids to you know, to kind of stop them from bringing strange things home from their family vacation. Definitely. I, I guess the lesson is uh, be careful what pets you bring home. Yeah. Also, here's my question. How do you mistake a rat for a dog? I mean, uh, the tail is kind of a dead giveaway, right? Yeah, that was like as soon as as soon as you said it was it was a giant rat, like I'm just picturing this rat and I think it was kind of morphing into what could pass for a dog, but it never got there in I, my head. I also think this is an unfortunate sort of uh, stereotype of the Chihuahua, which is probably in North America, the dog most associated with Mexico. Yeah, People make fun of that breed for being rat-like, being very scrawny with a skinny tail, even though, I don't know, you put a Chihuahua and a rat side by side, I don't think I'm going to confuse the two. I'm just, I don't know. I would love to see this as a Goosebumps episode and see how they how they interpret it because it's just I can also picture what the parents look like as well like it's just a very (laughs) very interesting interesting group Uh, well speaking of interesting that was uh, an interesting tale to go through Becky we want to thank you for being on this edition of fiction or or non-fiction we're going to be back next week where we're going to be sharing some more information sussing out the truth or the unreality of some other stories. Uh, But until then, I'm Adam. I'm Dave. And this has been... Fiction. Or nonfiction.